Okay, hey, we're back. Let's get into it. Hope you had a nice little break. Let's get into part two and um, get ready to go. All right, so we're going to talk about T waves. We were talking about the ST segments and what they can mean. We knew ST elevation we meant, um, first off, we knew ST elevation meant a STEMI, but it can mean other things too. So let's get into the T waves. We're going to talk about these T waves. So what we already know about T waves are that peaked T waves typically mean an acute MI, right? This is the first stage going into an acute MI. After this, we would see ST elevation. This is the very first phase of the MI cycle, basically, this peaked, tall, peaked T. Inverted Ts, we learned that they also mean, they mean a recent MI. So the more deeply inverted, they, the more recent the MI. So like just a few hours ago versus a few weeks ago, we're going to see um, different sizes um, in that uh, T wave, how deeply inverted it is. Okay, so we're on our page here, number 10 under T waves um, of your packet. In case you took a break and came back a different day, that's where we're at, number 10. So peak T's um, usually mean acute MI and inverted T's usually mean a recent MI. But guess what? There's more. There's always more, right? There's always more, of course. All right, so there are other things that peak T's can mean. They literally can mean just about anything, okay? <laughs> we just have to piece it together with other clues, okay? So once we do that, it's like playing a game of Clue, basically. So uh, peak T's can also mean hyperkalemia. They can also mean ischemia. And they can be normal. So how the heck do we tell the difference, right? I know it seems like there's so many variables, you know, like, well, I just learned what PT does. Why does it have to be five different things? Okay, so it's, it's again, we're following the clues. We suspect it's a certain thing. And then we follow through with further testing. So we're going to walk through the testing, how we actually determine it and figure it out. Okay, so first off, what does hyperkalemia mean? So when you think of K on the elemental chemical and chemistry, the elements, K is potassium. So hyperkalemia with the K right in the, center, in the middle here, it refers to high potassium levels. And we know what ischemia is, and then we're going to figure out normal. So hyperkalemia, so potassium actually is one of those ions that does the depolarization in the heart muscle. So if we have weird potassium levels, high ones or low pat ones, we don't depolarize properly. So that's where it's all coming from, why these electrolytes and everything have to be spot on, okay? All right, so an acute MI, so difference in peak T's. So when talking about the peak T's, the peak T's, the tall ones that look like a tent. So it is an acute MI. A peak T can tell us we're going to have a heart attack or just about to have one if we have those signs and symptoms of a heart attack. They have diaphoresis, diaphoretic. They have chest pain, angina. They have shortness of breath, dyspnea. They have all of those things that kind of lead us to believe they're having a heart attack. They may have had a prior heart attack. They might be 75 years old with high blood pressure. We have lots of things that we can ask them about all their signs and symptoms that's going to lead us to think that's an acute MI. If it's a 20 year old with chest pain, it's it's not most likely a heart attack. Okay. It's not most likely acute MI. So age is going to play into this. Um, there are signs and symptoms, any family history, their own background history. Um, so we ask questions while we're hooking them up for the EKG machine. I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions about their background and, um, you know, family history and all that. Okay. It plays into factor. Excuse me for a moment. So hyperkalemia, if we su suggest high potassium, they usually have some reason to have high potassium. The most common one that I find in the hospital is that people, these are renal patients. So they've had kidney failure. Um, they're on dialysis. Um, they have known kidney failure. Um, they're not putting out the urine they're supposed to. It's dark in color. Um, these people usually have high levels of potassium. There are some medications that can cause you to have high levels of potassium and or low levels of potassium. Um, but for the most part, I see this in renal patients most often. And they can be of all ages, stages of kidney failure. Um, but this is one reason. And people in kidney failure also tend to have higher troponins. It's um, Your heart and kidneys are 
connected. So anytime one is under stress, the other one typically is too. So we see trends like that as well. Um, and it can be a normal variant. So it's a healthy patient without any reasons to have hyperkalemia. Um, it might be LVH related. It might be one of those nice young people, um, especially young male athletes. I see this in my teenagers a lot, these um, athletes in the high school that have these tall peak T's with their LVH. Okay, so that's a possibility too. Again, age is going to play into this and signs and symptoms. And then if we just can't figure it out, we're going to move forward with some further testing, which we'll get into here. So hypokalemia um, is the opposite, obviously, of hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia, high, um, high potassium causes tall T waves. Okay. Hypokalemia, low potassium causes flat T waves. So just the opposite. Hyperkalemia, tall. Hypokalemia, flat, flat. You occasionally will see a U wave. So there is actually a U wave that occasionally shows up here. You can see it here, a very flat T and a second wave right after the T is called the U wave. Very difficult to see. I don't see them very often. Um, we occasionally see them. You don't see them in every single lead. It shows up in one or two leads and that's it. But um, there are some arrhythmias that go along with hypokalemia as well. You might see some frequent PVCs. Um, they might be in AFib. They might um, be tachycardic. Uh, again, those T waves are gonna be flat and occasionally you'll see a U wave that comes right behind the T. And again, remember it goes alphabetical, P, Q, R, S, T, U. So that makes sense. It would be right after the T wave. Yeah, it's usually a little smaller um, than the T wave or the T wave is so flat, you see the U wave after the T wave. So it's hard to see. Um, your machine typically picks it up if it's there at all, okay? So it is, the potassium is used for that, that repolarization. So it affects that way. It's why it affects the T wave because that is the repolarization of the ventricles. And if we're slowing it down um, because we don't have enough, then our T wave is going to be flat. It should make sense. All right, so hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is the high potassium. We have a um, potassium that's greater than 5.1. Um, and again, it's used in repolarization. So if we have extra of it, it's going to be extra repolarization. <laughs> so we have too many potassium ions repolarizing themselves. Okay, just it's over exaggerated. That's where our big tall T comes from. Over exaggeration of the repolarization. Okay, so again, it comes a lot of times with kidney damage or um, they've had blood infusions um, that had extra amounts of potassium. There is that, I'm sure you guys have heard of rhabdo. My daughter-in-law actually had rhabdo. If you've never met someone who has have had rhabdo, I know someone, okay? We think it's like this far off thing that doesn't really happen. It happened to my poor daughter-in-law. She took a spin class. She hadn't exercised in a while. Dude, she couldn't walk. Her urine was brown. Like she was, it was bad. Another, another conversation for another time. Ask me about it in class. So um, the T wave, tall and peaked, um, the P and R waves are going to be small. The P wave may actually not even be there. Um, the QRS could be widened. So if they're having too much potassium, we're going we're gonna to counteract that with some sodium bicarb. Okay, so that's going to bring our potassium back down into normal levels if we throw some sodium bicarb in there. Okay, um, so if you see some, I didn't go over the arrhythmias, I just realized that. So Occasionally, they're bradycardic. You might have some sort of heart escape. Um, the fibs, the AFib, the VFib, first degree A blocks, all this stuff. But this is what normally causes it, the hyperkalemia. How do we confirm they have hyperkalemia with this tall T wave? We pull blood and check their potassium level. That's it. So we're going to see the change on the EKG. You'll see this tall peak T wave. And we can't really think of anything else. They don't have signs and symptoms of having a heart attack. So like, do we have to run troponins? I mean, we would just to make sure because they're related. We're assuming it has something to do with potassium level, maybe their kidneys. So we're gonna pull blood and check potassium. That's really how you check for it. That's it, simple. All right, so this is what hyperkalemia looks like on an EKG, um, normal. Potassium, normal T, up to about 7. We start to get peaked. 8, a little higher. 10, 11. Now look what happens to the QRS. We get These are dangerous levels of potassium. 
we are not able to depolarize and repolarize the proper way. We start to get up here. There's too much potassium flooding the gates, basically. Okay, we can't depolarize properly. Once we get over 12, we're not even have, we don't even have remnants of what a heartbeat looks like. Okay, so we're having some problems here. I have seen people up in the eights and nines in the hospital. Yeah. Um, and they're like, I don't feel any sort of way. I don't feel different. Well, you definitely look different on your EKG. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's talk about calcium. Calcium is another one of those that we see as our helping to depolarize, repolarize, right? So our calcium levels normal is supposed to be 9 to 11. Um, low calcium, so hypocalcium, low calcium does decrease the contraction. Um, so we can't contract as much if we don't have enough calcium going through the calcium channels then it decreases our contraction. So we can't squeeze as hard. The QRS and the QT interval can change. It usually lengthens. Um, so the QT interval is going to get a longer, elongates, and the ST segment actually may become depressed. Okay, so we're going to see a longer QT, longer QT than normal. It's supposed to be 0.36 to 0.44. We might see 0 0.5, 0 0.55, 0 0.6 in a hypocalcemic person, and you might see some ST depression as well. If I'm going too fast, you just pause and come back with me when you're ready. Okay, so hypercalcemia, so this is the opposite, high levels of calcium. Now we've got too much, too much calcium trying to depolarize, repolarize. We've got an influx of calcium kind of taking over. So that QT is now going to be short. So Hypocalcemia, long QT, hypercalcemia, short QT. It doesn't take as long to repolarize. Okay. So it increases contraction. So it does it faster. So not always the best thing. Um, it can cause some other issues if it's going too fast. It's it's just not able to completely dump the blood like it should or push it like it should. So if we're going a little too fast, this can mess up the cardiac cycle as well. All right, let's take a look at, um, for quick reference, this is what, see, notice the peak T waves just kind of look all the same, right? So ischemic peak T wave and hyperkalemia peak T wave are going to look very similar. One might be a little bit wider than others, but they're still going to have that tall peak to it. Hypercalcemia is going to be that T wave is going to be short, that QT um, will be shortened, and hypocalcemia, it'll be elongated. What is not on this list right here is the hypokalemia, where the T wave will be flat. Okay, so just remember that they're opposites. Just a quick reference guide. All right, so let's go through some examples. So this is our first patient that we've seen at the hospital today. Um, it is a 57-year-old male patient. They are coming in with some chest presser, pressure. They are diaphoretic. When I say diaphoretic, that means sweaty, clammy, not like we just worked out sweaty, clammy, but like gray, sweaty, clammy, like don't look good, could pass out type diaphoretic, okay? Dyspnea means they have short of breath, and then we hook up the EKG machine and we take this EKG below. So looking at this, we see some, um, we're going to do it by, by regions of the heart. So I'm going to look at one in AVL, the lateral region. I actually don't see any changes here. 2, 3, and AVF, I do see some changes. Do you see them? I see both ST depression here and here, and here is an inverted T kind of depression. It might be just a depression with a T wave right there. How do you tell the difference? Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference if it's ST depression or T wave inversion. If you follow the depression and back up and find a T wave right after it, then it is depression. So this is depression. It's the downsloping kind and these are horizontal. So I have ST depression in 2, 3, and AVF. Okay, that means there's a ischemic response there. Then I go over to V1, 2, 3, and 4, the anterior region of the heart. I see those tall peak T's, right? Typically that means we have the start of a STEMI, could mean hyperkalemia, could mean, but because of his age and the symptoms, I'm gonna assume this is a STEMI. You can actually see that in V1. This is the isoelectric line here. It's elevated up to here. Same with here, elevated, elevated. This is just a PT. 
And then in five and six, the apical region, we have a little bit of depression going on again, headed into peak T's. So this is definitely, I'm suspecting, a STEMI. Okay, so you can circle those things on your EKG. Circle this one and this one and this one. Circle what I saw, ST depression and the peak T's and ST elevation. So I think he's having a STEMI in the anterior region of the heart, and the reciprocal is actually 2, 3, and AVF. So that should be depression, which we did see. So how am I going to confirm that this guy's having a heart attack? Think for a second. How are you going to confirm it? We always like that backup confirmation, don't we? I'm going to pull blood. You're right. If you thought of that, I'm going to pull blood. What am I checking? Troponins. We're going to check troponins. If they have high troponin levels, then we are not, we are, um, we are for sure have a STEMI. We're going to go in and take a cath lab and go through some tests and see if we need to go stem cell. So under interpretation and further testing, write down that this guy is having a STEMI in the anterior region, ischemia in the inferior region, and further testing would include troponins. Because he's got tall T's, we might throw potassium in there just in case. But I really think this is MI related. Pause if you need to finish writing. I'm going into example number two. So this is a 17-year-old patient. They present for a regular family checkup, and they do an EKG just because this person plays lots of sports, and they want to make sure that they're going to be good playing sports. Patient shows no signs or symptoms. This is just a routine EKG. So what is present on the EKG um, that we notice different than a regular EKG um, and our interpretation of this? Okay, so again, we look in 1 and AVL. They look pretty normal, PQRST. 2, 3 and AVF, those all look normal. I see a little notch there, but that's okay. That can be early repoll. He's young, right? He's 17. Um, V1, 2, 3, and 4, I have some tall T's, a little bit of LVH going on. 5 and 6, tall T's, LVH. This is a very normal looking EKG for a 17-year-old. They have a strong heart, especially if they're an athlete. Um, and we're going to see tall T's and big QRSs. This is very normal. This is a normal EKG for a 17-year-old. So on your interpretation for B, this is 16B, by the way. Um, I would circle the tall T's and the LVH's, tall T's, LVH, maybe the little notch here for early repoll. So he's got a very normal EKG for a 17-year-old athlete because of the peak T's and the, and the LVH and the age. We're going with the age. What is the age, right? Okay, if you're still writing, pause it. I'm going to move on to um, the third example. This is a 48-year-old female that wasn't feeling well during dialysis. Ding, ding, ding. That should give you a clue right there. An EKG was taken and shown below. What further testing would you request? And what is our interpretation? So on your EKG packet here, it is letter C, um, 48-year-old female that wasn't feeling well. Okay. And this is during dialysis. So we know that they have a renal issue, right? If they're in dialysis, we know they have a renal issue. So let's look at our regions. Again, we go 1 and AVL is the lateral region. The only thing I see is the QRSs are really small, but other than that, everything else is normal. 2, 3, and AVF, PQRSTs all look normal. V1, 2, 3, and 4, I can see those really tall peak Ts there. 1, 2, 3 boxes tall, very tall peak Ts in the anterior region. And 5 and 6 are apical region, working on a peak T, but not in both, so it's non-diagnostic. So we see really tall T's. So this can mean, remember the peak T's can mean lots of different things. It can mean hyperkalemia. It can mean a start of an MI. It can mean ischemia. It can mean a normal variance depending on the age. So we've got to kind of pull out all the stops here. We're going to do some further testing. She's 48. 48 is kind of young to have an MI, but she's got renal issues. So we don't really don't know. So because of these peak T's here, circle those on your EKG. Because of the peak T's, we're going to check troponins. It might be an MI. We're also going to check potassium because she just might have hyperkalemia. Peak T's can mean hyperkalemia. And then it's also going to cross off our list for ischemia. So if her troponins come back fine, it could be ischemia. If troponins and potassium are fine, then the peak T is ischemia. If the potassium comes back high, it's hyperkalemia. If the troponins come back high, it's a, it's a start of a heart attack. 
we just diagnosed her just by doing the further step and taking you know, it's a game of clue basically right okay so my interpretation of this is it's probably hyperkalemia but i'm going to test potassium troponins to to confirm okay now if those all come back normal and we think it's ischemia we can actually do one step further we can go into a stress test and confirm it's ischemia and not you know why she's having pts at 48 years old does that make sense okay pause if you haven't finished reading make sure you write all that down on your interpretation i'm moving on to example four or i'm not moving on to sample four i thought there was a four but it isn't <laughs> Let's talk about the T wave inversions. Okay, so T wave inversions, especially in V1, 2, and 3, are completely normal in children and adolescents. Okay, so there are several things telling me that this is a three year old EKG. Number one, big, tall, skinny QRSs. Okay, right away, big, tall, skinny QRSs. These don't look like normal adult EKGs, um, QRSs. Okay, and they're very skinny. I also noticed the heart rate's a little faster, 300, 150. It's a little over 100, about 120, okay? Heart rate's a little faster, smaller body, faster heart. I also noticed that there are inverted T waves in V1, 2, and 3. Very normal for children. As they age up into adolescence, they start to flip over. V3 will flip over first, then V2. And sometimes V1 never flips over. My, my V1 occasionally is upside down. Just my normal. As long as it doesn't match anything else in the, there's no other ones that have inverted T's at my age, then um, it's just my normal variant, non-diagnostic. Lots of things tell me this is a three-year-old EKG. Get those written down, circle them, and write those indications down below your EKG on your paper. Then we talk about adolescent EKGs. They are often peak T waves and or T wave inversion. And then they have LVH if they're an active teenager. Again, um, they do correct themselves. The T waves do turn over and, and get smaller as they age um, and lose their athleticism, unfortunately. <laughs> it's so terrible. We have to lose it, right? I know. I'm there. I'm in that age. Oh, okay, so in this one here, this is definitely a teenager one. Um, we see tall T's, right? Um, and we see some inverted T's. So this is a teenage one. Now, if I knew this person was 17, 18, this would be normal. I really wouldn't worry about it. If this was a 67-year-old that came in with a, for an EKG, I'd be like, hmm, we need to pull, we need to check this. I would check a couple different things. I would check troponin levels just to make sure this isn't a heart attack starting. And I would also check potassium levels for P those PTs. So if it's an age appropriate, tall T LVH, it's normal. If it's an older person with chronic high blood pressure, kidney issues, all this stuff, it's not normal. So age really plays a factor in this. Okay, and I think I have that written down here for number 19. Yeah, here we go. So number 19, it says first. So how do we tell the difference? First, check the age of the patient. Okay, that's what you do first. We need to know the age. Absolutely. Then, for B, then the reason for the EKG. So signs and symptoms. Why are we doing this EKG? Do you coming in with chest pain? Were you short of breath? Do you have back pain? Um, is this just for a physical for school? Okay. Your potassium levels were low, so we're going to try and do an EKG and see what your T waves look like. So know that peaked and inverted T's usually are usually abnormal when they're accompanied with symptoms. So if this person is just having a normal, regular old EKG, they don't have any symptoms, and their age is young, we're not going to worry about it. Okay, but if they have symptoms, they're typically abnormal then. So if you find a peaked T without symptoms and they have other reasons to assume they're sick, like renal failure it's most likely hyperkalemia. And then if you find inverted or PTs with symptoms, then you need to do other tests to perform. So we're gonna check for MIs, recent MIs, upcoming MIs, potassium levels, stress tests for ischemia. We're just gonna keep going until we figure it out, process of elimination, okay? All 
All right, we're rolling and rolling here. Again, if you need to continue to write some stuff down, pause it here. I'm going to keep going. Let's go through some interpretation. We're going to go through these in class as well. Um, but here's your first interpretation. So, again, break it down by region. Okay, region. One in AVL. This is the lateral region of the heart across the top. I do see this is the isoelectric line and the isoelectric line here. So can you see what's going on here? This is the isoelectric line. If you said ST elevation, you are correct. There is elevated here. It looks kind of like a fireman's hat sideways. This one's like a fireman's hat without a front. <laughs> I'm going to call that ST elevation in one and AVL. That means if I see elevation here, I should see depression here because this is inferior, 2, 3 in AVF, the reciprocal right? And I do see, looks a little bit like the digoxin scooping, but it's definitely um, depressed. And I move over anteriorly, V1, 2, 3, and 4. I'm looking for changes that match in any of those four leads. I definitely see my isoelectric line here, and here I definitely see some ST elevation. My J point is well above the isoelectric line here, 2 and 3, and four. Five is a little elevated, six is not, so that's non-diagnostic, but my heart attack or STEMI is happening right about here. So interpretation for this one, circle everything that you saw that wasn't right. So we see ST elevation here and here and here, and depression here and here, elevation, elevation. So your interpretation would be that they're having an MI or a STEMI in the lateral and anterior region. Lateral being one in AVL, anterior, including V2, 3, and 4. We saw reciprocal changes in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF, with ST depression. Okay. If you didn't get it, rewind me. Go back again. We're moving on. All right, this one here, again, look at 1 in AVL. I don't see any changes there. 2, 3, and AVF. Something weird. Something looks a little strange here. We are a little bit depressed here, right? Just slightly, very slightly depressed. But I see over here in V1, 2, 3, 4, very tall peak T's with some ST depression. And then in 5 and 6, we have ST depression. So there's some stuff going on here. Um, very tall T's. What would become helpful? Signs and symptoms would be helpful. Maybe age, um, if they have any renal conditions, right? So Circle what you don't see, what you see was wrong. Again, circle the peak T's. If you have to pause me at any point because I'm going too fast, just pause. Peak T's, circle those in V2, 3, and 4, and ST depression in 2, 3, and AVF. So you can write that in your interpretations. What other tests would we do for this? What causes peak T's or what can cause peak T's? Potassium, so you're going to check potassium level. It can also mean we're headed into an MI, so we're going to definitely check troponins. Uh huh. Going to check troponins and potassium. Um, what if those two come back fine? Potassium level is fine, troponin level is fine. We're going to check for ischemia by doing a stress test. So, those are three things that I would test on this patient. All right, let's move on to this one. This one, I've seen this before, maybe before, some things should like jump out at you. You should be like, hmm, I've seen this before. This is probably um, this and this and this, right? One in AVL look fine, two, three in AVF look fine. What I noticed right away is those QRSs. They are very large, right? We have LVH going on. And they're tall and skinny. That usually means a kid, right? Let's confirm that by looking at the cure of the T waves. So are the T waves inverted in V1, 2, and 3? By golly, they are. I'm going to assume this is a kid, okay? And if this is a child, perfectly normal. If this is an adult that's like 65 years old with symptoms like chest pain, not normal. Very large LVH, inverted T waves can mean recent MI or ischemia. So what's important? I think I asked you that on num yeah, number two. Why, what information would be helpful to diagnose this? 
their age and symptoms, right? Always the age and symptoms. If you have that available, that's what we get. My emergency room docs don't even want me to give them an EKG without giving them age and symptoms because they, they need to be, be able to interpret quickly and be able to tell if it's an emergency or not. All right, so write all that down in your interpretations. I'm moving on again. This one, interesting. Hmm. You guys go ahead. You have it on your paper. I'm not going to give you the answer to this one. I'm going to let you guys kind of figure it out on your own, and we'll go over it in class. And there's one more after that. This one right here. Again, remember to break them down into 1 in AVL and 2, 3 in AVF. And then V1 through 4 and 5 and 6. Those are grouped together, the different regions of the heart, and it can tell you where they're having some sort of issue. And if they need to do a, cath a catheterization, they would know exactly where to look, right? Yeah. I think that's our last one. That was excellent. So, all right, all done for this lesson. I will see you guys on Monday. Um, make sure that you uh, completed everything, your notes are filled out, and I'll see you on Monday to review. See you then.